Hi, I'm Gavin Giovanoni. I'm the uh, Professor of Neurology at uh, Barton London School of Medicine and Dentistry. And uh, I'd just like to give you an uh, update on a presentation I gave to the International Women in MS uh, weekly MS COVID-19 meetings on the 20th of May. You can watch the presentation I gave on YouTube. Uh, and the actual um, thumbnail actually is an interesting picture of a lymph node uh, in a control on the left hand side versus um, a lymph node that is taken from somebody who's been treated with uh, uh, rituximab and you can see those little brown dots um, you see lots of these little brown dots um, which are germinal centers are missing in the lymph node of rituximab treated patients now germinal centers are very important little areas of the lymph node and spleen where B cells are educated uh, to start making uh, very high affinity uh, antibodies uh, uh, targeting, for example, uh, proteins on, on viruses, for example. Um, so what happens in the uh, germinal center is the B cells get T cell help and they class switch. In other words, they produce different types of immunoglobulin. For example, they all switch from IgM to IgG and a particular isotype of IgG, say IgG1 or IgG3. And then they go undergo a process called affinity maturation, which is an evolutionary process that selects the most high affinity and the most reactive antibodies against the particular protein. So when you don't have uh, germinal centers, which happens when people are on an anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody, you can't make high affinity antibodies. And that may be relevant in the time of COVID-19, and I'll go into that. I made the point in the presentation that in terms of fighting uh, the coronavirus, the SARS coronavirus 2, when you get it, it's almost certainly innate immunity, particularly neutrophils, macrophages, and reactive T cells, particularly the CD8 T cells that are antiviral clears the virus. Uh, and then once you've cleared the virus, uh, you recover from the infection. Uh, what protects you possibly from getting a second infection, in other words, re-exposure to the virus, uh, almost certainly requires um, uh, immunity, both from the T cell compartment, including CD8s and probably CD4s, and uh, what we call neutralizing antibodies. These are antibodies that bind to the receptor on the coronavirus stopping it binding to the uh, human tissue so it can actually penetrate the cell and initiate an infection. So the immune response, if you haven't seen the virus before, in the primary response is quite different to the uh, memory response or the secondary response that protects you from reinfection or infection with new, new mutants. I also made the point that you don't need B cells. Um, and potentially you don't need immunoglobulin uh, to recover from COVID-19. And the example I gave was these two case reports from Italy of uh, two males who had what we call X-linked, because it's on the X chromosome, a gamma globulinemia. In other words, these people have a genetic deficiency in the uh, production of B cells. So they have no B cells. They don't make any antibody. Now, these people are kept alive by, given, by being given antibody from the population. We call that uh, intravenous immunoglobulin therapy. But as the population's never seen the coronavirus before, <clears throat> they don't uh, necessarily have antibodies to the virus. But there's a catch. Uh, new evidence suggests that maybe exposure to the common viruses, the coronaviruses, the ones that cause the common cold, may have cross-reactive antibodies that, that protect you. So I can't claim that uh, you don't need uh, immunoglobulin um, uh, to protect you from getting uh, uh, COVID-19 or severe COVID-19. These individuals may have received uh, antibody from uh, blood donors who had cross-reactive antibodies generated by wild-type other coronaviruses that could have dampened down the severity of the infection. So I think we need to be a little bit circumspect. I'll come back to that. Uh, from new evidence that has just been published in the journal Cell. The, the one thing that's been worrying me and it keeps worrying me is uh, Jan Hillet from the Swedish MS Registry presented the updated data in that May meeting just showing you that uh, the number of patients that had been reported with COVID-19 in uh, Sweden, there were 74 
of which 16 were hospitalized, uh, and about two th about two thirds of them were on disease modifying treatment. But there was clearly an over representation uh, on patients that had uh, rituximab um, treatment. That, I mean, Sweden is quite an unusual country in that one in three patients uh, on an off-label uh, monoclonal antibody rituximab. But there looks like I'm almost a doubling of risk uh, in terms of getting COVID-19 uh, on rituximab compared to other disease-modifying therapy. And when I hacked the data and just did a crude, uh, what we call a chi-squared statistical test, it was highly significant. Uh, people on rituximab are more likely uh, to get COVID-19 in Sweden uh, compared to people with multiple sclerosis on other disease-modifying therapy. When I tried to see if there was a, an increased risk uh, of getting severe COVID-19, there were probably too few patients or subjects in this analysis. It, wa it wasn't significant, although there looks like there is a trend um, suggesting that rituximab puts you at higher risk of getting severe COVID-19. And similarly, uh, there wasn't a significant uh, effect when you looked at the numbers of those going into intensive care unit. And I've limited this to patients on DMT, these analyses simply because the population that aren't on DMT are likely to be very different, probably older, more likely to be progressive. Uh, and so that that's some confounders you can uh, try and get away with with doing this analysis. I think, um, importantly, Jan Hillett made the point when he presented the data from the MS registry that actually it wasn't confounded by age, uh, simply because the patients on rituximab were younger and less disabled. So this, if anything, is possibly a real signal uh, emerging from the Swedish data that rituximab and anti-CD20 therapy affects uh, your risk of getting COVID-19. Now, how it does this is another story. He did, did, um, he did compare it to nadaluzumab, and the ratios were very similar. Fewer patients in Sweden, only one in 10 on nadaluzumab. Um, but the ratio in terms of proportion being hospitalized was similar. And so he actually suggested that maybe this was ascertainment bias because people on infusion therapies, be it rituximab or nalizumab, are having to be contacted <clears throat> to have their infusion dates changed or whatever. And that may create ascertainment bias and you're more likely to get a reporting of COVID-19 from people that have been contacted. Another confounder is because these are infusion therapies, these people are more likely to come to hospital to get their therapies. And we now know that hospitals or healthcare facilities are a main major source of being infected with the virus. So there are some confounders here in terms of picking up extra cases by contacting these people for their infusion dates uh, and also bringing them into the hospital where they're more likely to be exposed to the virus than if they weren't. Uh, so there are lots of confounders that need to be noticed. And he made the point in his discussion that um, until we have more numbers and we uh, account for the ascertainment bias and all these confounders, we can't be 100% sure um, <clears throat> that rituximab increases your risk of getting severe COVID-19 or COVID-19 as such. I then had put up this particular slide and I thought it was unlikely, um, unlikely that anti-CD20 therapy increased, increased your chance of becoming infected with the virus. And I point that out over here, I said unlikely. I'm beginning to have doubts, and the reason why I'm having doubts is uh, this paper came out uh, in Cell uh, a week or two ago, and what it looked at is immune responses, okay, immune responses to coronavirus in people that had COVID-19 and unexposed individuals. And what was important is that people that hadn't got COVID-19 or hadn't been infected with SARS coronavirus 2 had immunity uh, in about 40 to 60 percent of unexposed individuals had cross reactivity in terms of memory responses uh, to, to the um, SARS coronavirus 2. So what this is suggesting is that there may be cross immunity. In other words, if you've been exposed to the common coronaviruses that circulate in the human population that cause the common cold, immunity to those, although it's not long lived, may provide you immunity to um, the um, SARS coronavirus too. In other words, it may protect you from getting um, the infection and it may protect you from getting severe infection or going into intensive care, for example. 
So this may be one of the factors that explains why individual A is protected from getting severe coronavirus, whereas individual B doesn't. It may have to be due to pre-existing uh, uh, immunity to the other coronaviruses. hope that makes sense. Why is this important? Because if you are on a drug like uh, rituximab, for example, it may blunt immune responses and particularly memory responses to the common coronaviruses, and therefore it may reduce protection. So I, I've had to change this to possibly, maybe just possibly, people that are on an anti-CD20 therapy are unable to make adequate immunity or memory responses to the common coronaviruses, and therefore they are at higher risk of be, if they get exposed to the virus, getting asymptomatic infection. Similarly, because they don't have immunity, they may be at higher risk of getting COVID-19. And similarly, they may be at higher risk of getting severe COVID-19. Okay. And so these are all um, hypotheses that need to be tested. And I think uh, this is a really uh, rapidly evolving field. And we're going to have to wait for a larger data sets to come out. Hopefully, we will be able to uh, get the big uh, data uh, uh, analysis that's coming from the pooling of all the registry data that's been run by the International uh, Federation of MS Societies. Um, uh, uh, that will come to the table with some uh, larger data sets to um, support or disprove this hypothesis. But at the end of the day, I think to interpret the data, we're going to need basic science. We're going to have to go back to the population of people with multiple sclerosis and test these hypotheses and see uh, uh, whether or not at, at a seroprevalence level, what is the proportion of patients with asymptomatic infection versus symptomatic infection? And do they differ between the various DMTs? So I think we, we really need to try and think about how we uh, get a denominator. In other words, a comparator, a comparator that allows us to compare um, <clears throat> uh, the immune responses to coronavirus uh, on various DMTs. So I think this is a uh, evolving uh, uh, space, and I would urge you, um, because the place where this information t tends to surface first is on the International Women in Multiple Sclerosis uh, weekly, or no, it's going to be probably every two weeks now, that webinar where uh, uh, they invite different speakers, usually custodians of these registries, to uh, present their data and update it. Um, we're living in a time where um, uh, information is coming out at such a rapid rate that we have to continuously um, uh, adjust our um, uh, thinking about this. Now, the question is, is this relevant to COVID-19 because the pandemic has really been flattened and the tail is now, the, the chance of getting the infection is drop, dropping rapidly? Yes, I think it's relevant because what we're going to learn from the COVID-19 pandemic, even though the actual risk to individuals may disappear, is what happens to other viral infections. And so we have an, uh, an annual influenza epidemic. It happens almost every winter. We have a, a, a surge in influenza cases. And when we get severe influenza from a new strain, um, uh, pre-existing immunity may cross-react with that. And so if we can't make immune responses to pre-existing influenza strains, you know, that may put you at increased risk of getting severe influenza, for example. So yes, I think the lessons learned from understanding COVID-19 and how individual classes of disease-modifying therapy affect your risk of getting the infection, getting severe infection, uh, requiring intensive care or potentially dying from that infection is really, really important and it has implications for other viruses. And I think, you know, we've put in place all these uh, registers for collecting information around coronavirus. Um, I'm going to urge the MS community not to dismantle those reporting systems and keep them in place so we can look at what happens with uh, future epidemics, particularly the influenza being the most common. But who knows what the next epidemic may be? It may be another viral infection that emerges. So we have to uh, be hyper vigilant about this and this is really really important for individuals because at the end of the day um, decision making around specific DMTs uh, is about a risks and benefits and uh, if these risks accumulate with time uh, some people may uh, opt for safer uh, therapies <clears throat> and the other 
important thing looking at this lymph node is uh, vaccine readiness. And I made the point that uh, people on long-term anti-CD20 therapies that have a persistent peripheral B cell depletion are unlikely to be able to respond or to receive a coronavirus vaccine. And so we're going to have to think about how we de-risk the fact that people who haven't had coronavirus uh, may want to get vaccinated. So we're going to have to think of a way of potentially interrupting anti-CD20 therapy to at least allow peripheral B cell uh, reconstitution. Those cells that come back are not going to be memory cells initially. They'll come back from the bone marrow. They'll be naive. But you need naive uh, uh, B cells to, uh, to make new memory responses uh, to create a, a neutralizing uh, uh, antibody response to a vaccine. So um, the next um, topic, I think, will be the hot topic in this space will be vaccine readiness and getting the, the MS community ready. So when a vaccine does emerge, um, uh, we can vaccinate uh, the high, our high risk population of people with multiple sclerosis. Um, I've been saying up until now that we should probably cross that bridge when we get there, but that uh, bridge may come quite soon. You know, some people are now beginning to expect a vaccine a little bit earlier than we thought previously. And so we may have to um, uh, start planning for vaccine readiness in the next six to nine months. Thank you for listening. If you've got any questions, please, you can ask them on the YouTube channel or on the blog, and I'll try and answer them.